This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, and Isotope. You're hearing my voice right now on a Jay-Z pop filter and BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D mic pre and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. When you want to A-B anything, mics, amps, preamps, whatever it is, it's really nice and to me, super important to loop something, loop a little riff and have it going. Even the absolute best player is going to play a riff continually for you, but each pass is going to be different coming out of their fingers. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. If you're ready to discover the secrets to making your mixes sound great, no matter what your studio situation, then check out my free mixing course, MixMasterBundle.com, where I show you how to get great sounding mixes in your studio using simple techniques and free plugins. And when you're ready for more advanced studio skills, then check out RecordingStudioRockstars.com slash academy, where you can learn from Grammy-winning teachers to help you record, edit, mix, and master your best record ever. Use the code Rockstar right now at checkout for 10% off any course for a limited time. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record with confidence over USB-C with up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you wherever you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at Mac MaxSales.com slash Rockstars. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Dorian Hartsong, an American composer, producer, and multi-instrumentalist based in Los Angeles, California. As an artist, Dorian is currently playing bass for Jason Bonham's Led Zeppelin Evening. He is also well known for his bass work in Power Man 5000. Uh, he's constantly touring with bands such as Black Sabbath, Metallica, Kiss, Pantera, and Primus. Uh, Primus, wow, dude. And helped elevate Power Man 5000's album Tonight the Stars Revolt to platinum status and landed songs in movie soundtracks, including Zoolander, Scream 3, and Evolution. Dorian has also performed and recorded with other artists and producers, including Everlast, Vinnie Moore, Ruby Friedman Orchestra, The Flying Tigers, Dan Rocket, Stevie Salas, Michael Beinhorn, Lior Goldenberg, Sylvia Massey, Joe Barisi, and Terry Date, to name just a few. He and Stevie Salas also scored the indie film Live Free or Die, which won top jury prize at South by Southwest Film Festival in 2006. Um, I happen to personally have noticed that Z Zoe Deschanel is in that one. She's she's pretty cool, so that was cool to see. Dorian graduated from Berklee College of Music with a degree in songwriting and performance, and we're psyched to have him here on the show with us to talk today about all the great records he's made, but also talk about his home studio, which he's putting a lot of love and effort into getting. Uh, I think it's Dorian. Is it a new design that you're working on right now? Sort of new stuff. It is, uh, but bare bones. I'm sorry. I, I'll probably represent, you know, most of the the beginners here that are getting their thing together. But, we love uh, that. Yeah, we love I'm in that. a garage. <laughs> awesome, dude. Thank you so much to Lior Goldenberg for making our introduction. Lior, you rock, and we need to have you back on the show soon. Please welcome yeah. Dorian Hartson to Recording Studio Rockstars. Dorian, are you ready to rock, my friend? <laughs> affirmative affirmative <laughs> how does that feel to have me like blast you with that intro sometimes i wonder if you're just like you're like oh my gosh 
<laughs> it's that's funny that I was thinking, wow, this sounds way better than, <laughs> than what it. <laughs> but thanks for that. It sounded great. You're welcome, man. <laughs> you, well, you've done so much cool stuff. And in fact, even me just reading it, I th- I realized that I kind of uh, a couple of things I didn't pick up on at first. You know, you've done a lot of soundtrack stuff: Zoolander, Scream Three, Evolution. I don't remember if I saw that one. What was that movie? Dude, I don't think I saw it. Either. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there was like, you know, like morphing species from alien planets yes, or something. Right? That sounds about right, actually. Um, but a lot of those were just pre existing tracks, Power Man tracks that ended up on soundtracks. Right, right. So, you know, there was only a few instances where I actually scored to a film uh, or, you know, a short or a commercial yeah. or whatever. We'll, so we'll dig into that. But let me ask you this What did it feel like? To be, in, I mean, I'm hoping that you saw at least one of those movies. <laughs> what did it feel like <laughs> to be in the movie theater and hear your right. track, you know, your bass play and just come blasting on the big speakers? Um, from what I remember, I mean, always fun, um, you know, but I'm one of those tweakers who like I'll be watching and it comes on and then I'm listening, you know, acutely to the mix and and how, you know, is my right, bass being right. heard on the speakers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, missing the whole, you know, the whole you're, connection. You're, between. If it was at the end of the movie, you're like, why are these people getting up and leaving? What the heck? Come on, get back in your seat, dude. <laughs> where the credits aren't up. Come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But but fun, you know. Now, absolutely. where are you? You're out in L.A., right? I am. Okay, cool. But you, um, give us a little bit of a background into who you are. I mean, you you were at Berkeley in Boston. I think you said you spent some, live there. Was that part of the Berkeley time or did you go back and mm-hmm. live there longer than that? I mean, I probably spent a good 10 years in Boston. Yeah. Cool. Well, give us kind of like the brief yeah. arc of you getting into music and kind of, you know, having done all these things and now you're putting your studio sure. together. Um, okay. Well, let's see. I was born in D.C. actually, and then um, me too. And that's another thing we have in what? common. Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, and let's see. So from the beginning, uh, my biological father actually played Wicked Harp, and um, my mom told me that they they went down to Chicago a couple times um, just so he could try he, try and sit in with Muddy Waters, which he ended up doing, which is very cool. Um, Wow. And then let's see, I had, you a, remember I had seeing a, that? No, no. And it, he, he took off when I was really young. So, um, that's a whole nother podcast, okay, <laughs> <of course>. uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, but, but that's a notable right there. You know, I'm a muddy waters. The Newport is just like, wow, what a recording that is. Um, yeah. uh, my cousin played drums and, and so that got me into it really young. Um, he went to Berkeley. I guess uh, there's was blues early in my uh, childhood. Like I won a Paul Butterfield blues record when I was seven in a club. Uh, what was I doing in a club? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but my mom was kind of a, a flower child um, hippie. So I, I, it was it was like a day show. Anyways, I yeah. won that record and that kind of started me. And then I think I got Zep 3 from a neighbor and I just remember tuning into records early, like really hard. And then we moved to Boulder, Colorado, and um, in um, junior high concert band, I had a drum kit, and we played like "Hit Me with Your Best Shot" from uh, Pat ah. Benatar. So you know, and like, yeah. so I had some fills, and like, you know, some kids came up after, were like, um, "That was really cool," you know. And immediately, I'm like, "Oh yeah, this is this is my path. Here we go." <laughs> So drums um, was kind of your first jam. Yeah, I started out on drums. I did. And, uh, you know, did cover bands in Boulder. You know, I just, this just flashed into my head. Um, my best friend in high school, um, his it was a family friend of Jimmy Gersio, who was a producer. He produced Chicago and Earth, Wind & Fire. Anyways, he owned the famous Caribou Ranch. And uh, w- one night, um, The Who was in town and played. And they actually drove by his house in a limo to hopefully pick us up um, to take us out to the studio to hang and everything because uh, Jeff's mom, you know, told them about him and me being super into music. Anyways, we weren't there. We missed it. So like the rest of that school year, that's all we thought about and talked about is we missed that. Anyways, Never miss the limo. (laughs) Oh my God. So yeah. And then, and then, uh, 
I just remember being in um, the counselor's office in high school and and getting the question, you know, what do you what do you want to do? What are you going to do in your life? Blah, blah, blah. And I just I was like, I don't know communications. I was just blanking. I'm a fucking Meet musician, girls. you know? And yeah. Anyways, I applied to Berkeley and um, and I got in. And, and what did you go I, to study, drums or bass? It, well, I came in as a drummer, and I was actually interested in mp e music production and engineering. Yeah. And um, I failed the intro course. <laughs> <It's> like the, <laughs> the math and just like I, the pressure. I, I don't know. I just said... It wasn't, it wasn't happening. So, um, I moved on to, um, songwriting and, uh, I bought a Tascam Porta one just to keep the, uh, you know, the dream alive of, of being a producer engineer. <laughs> and, um, there were not a lot of, um, bass players in school. It seemed it was like guitar players and drummers everywhere. And, uh, because I could play, uh, I just had a lot of friends asking me to do their recitals, to do their, uh, recording studio stuff, whatever it was. So it, and I just, because I was a drummer, I took to it, you know, the rhythm thing really quickly and, uh, and just kind of the bass thing just blossomed. And then, um, after I got out of school, that's when I, I was working at Tower Records, which is, that's in, in Boston too, right? <laughs> in Boston. Yeah. yeah. Right on Newberry there. And, um, that's where it's from originally, isn't it? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't, I, that, what about the one on Sunset? That seems like maybe that was the flagship. I just, so when I, I think of LA, I think of Amoeba, but you're probably right. I mean, you're probably right. Dude, a quickly, Amoeba just reopened a new store. Uh, like last week I saw a line like three blocks out for the grand opening. Wow. And wow. What a time to be opening you know, a record store. Like, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I was very, very happy to see that. That's going super down, cool. So. That's super cool. Yeah, I miss record stores, man. I mean, I mean, we've got them here. Um, there's some great ones in East Nashville. Um, I yeah. guess, I, I guess, what I mean is, I miss going. I used to love exactly. to exactly get your coffee, go by the record store, go by the uh, the you know the like the um, consignment music used music gear store, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. All right, I, I digress. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, well, let me throw this in too. Uh, yes, rock yes. stars, Dorian and I have some parallel paths. Uh, not Boulder, but you know, a little bit of where we were born, maybe a little bit of Boston. Um, yeah. But also, it turns out we went to the same camp at different yeah. times up in Maine. So we'll just yeah. we'll leave you all guessing. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> and then ye yesterday, like I talked to you for the first, well, messaged with you for the first time and you, you said you were going to get chili and I was staring at a pot of chili that we had just made. So as my, as my cousin would say, <laughs> <laughs> see, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, all right. So let's see. So you did the Boston thing. So uh, I did the Boston thing. I was at tower. I met, um, spider and Al Pahanish at tower records and, and, Power Man 5000 pretty much formed uh, there. And so that was a Boston band. It was a Boston band for a I while. No yeah. Idea. And that was probably, you know, six years of building up the local thing um, until we got uh, major label attention. And um, it started off as very hip hop, actually. And um, <laughs> the first gig were, it was like turntable guys, no guitar, uh, go go dancers. Um, you know, and then, uh, Al and I, uh, the drummer, um, playing to tracks, I'm on bass at this point. And, and this um, is nineties. This is nineties. This is like, yeah, 90, 91. Um, on bass, I was like trying to mix. I, I was super into Hendrix at that point. Yeah. And I was re really starting to get into Sly and meters and, and James Brown and, but I still had the Van Halen rock thing. So I was, I started doing, uh, you know, wah and distortion with the bass try, kind of a guitar thing trying to cover that because we didn't have guitar so that's a little bit of how like i really got into effects and um so you didn't started, start out playing drums with those guys though do you think correct that the reason is because you already had like the dj loop thing so you had picked a different instrument um no i was just asked to to go play with these guys because i i played uh bass with with Al uh, Panish and some some blues gigs around town on bass, so cool. Um, yeah. So I think I mentioned this to you, but 
uh, previously in one of our emails. But here at the studio, uh, you know, I did the Bonnaroo Hay Bale Studio for 15 years. I checked that out. It sounds really good. Yeah, thank for you. For a hay bale room? Yeah. Holy yeah. Well, I <laughs> wish you guys had come through. That would have been fun to record. Um, but but one of the things we do is we have a ton of stuff that we have to haul around. So and And part of that is a lot of power strips and extension cords and things like that. So those got thrown, you know, all tossed into this old, um, you know, like um, Soviet era um, backpack that I bought when I was traveling in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, over in that part of the world, right about 91, actually. Um, and so they, they ended up in a closet here, but we always called that power bag 5,000. So that's ah. what we refer to it here at the studio. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard them all. <laughs> Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound hi Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual individual plug-in purchase. Okay, awesome. Well, so um, tell us a little bit about your studio that you're in now. I mean, we'll, we'll have more chance to talk about many of the other things you've done, but you're, you know, we're on a video right now, which is, uh, I don't always do, but right now I can kind of see you started putting together this cool studio in your garage space. Tell us about that. Well, yeah. Well, if actually, uh, I just moved actually, and that's why I'm working on it. But um, before my house, before I had a detached garage, which I built in. And I don't know, that was probably about 15 years ago um, when I had a lot of juice and, uh, you know, and now it's a little more daunting at my age. And uh, we really went for it as far as, uh, you know, floating floor and staggered studs and, you know, really just trying to check all the boxes, if, mostly for soundproofing. Was that the and, name of your band too, the Staggered Studs? Ah, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, so it was. It ended up being relatively small and dead. So um, it was really good for for mixing and uh, tracking everything except drums. You know, drums. Like if you want to, you know, you want that ambient thing. Like I wasn't going to get it there, so I do drums elsewhere and do the rest there which I think a lot of people are doing at this point. You know, I, I think a lot of people are probably doing drums in the box, which uh, th th there's another podcast. But, yeah, well, uh, we'll talk about some of that stuff because, I mean, you've, um, again, Rockstars, we've got a playlist of Dorian's music in in the show notes. Just click through and you can check it out. But you've done a couple of instrumental records in there, which we'll circle back and, and talk more okay. about. But those drums sound great. So oh, wow. I don't know how you're getting them, but we want to know all about it in a minute. Okay. Okay, cool. So, um, so I had that. So then, so I moved and now this garage is not detached. So I've got, you know, much bigger soundproofing issues to deal with. So, you know, I've just been going through it like placement, the best place for my monitors, this and, you know, and I got, I went to gig acoustics and I got some bass traps and, uh, soaked it up immediately. Like I was really pleased just putting up you know, eight, eight or 10 panels in, in the room and, um, it, it's working, you know, but I, I'm really re starting to rely on headphones, even though it's nice to have the monitors up and going, like I, I've just found like more and more, especially mixing, there's just nothing like having that source that close to your ear and, um, really hearing the, the super details. Um, but yeah, so the studio, so my plan is, to build a booth within uh, the room. Um, so I'll have something I can do. Um, my wife's an actor, so we're always doing voiceover auditions and stuff. So um, 
you know, we'll do that. We'll do acoustic guitar. We'll do amps in there. And then I'll throw a small kit in there for rehearsing and maybe a few things I can get away with, you know, singer songwriter, maybe some pop stuff. I, I, we'll see what happens in the booth, but, um, but to, and also just while we're on it, your yeah. voice sounds great on this podcast. Tell the rock stars what you're using right now, because it really sounds spot oh, cool. on. It's just a, uh, an SM seven B the lower price, um, stock thing for, for VOs and voice stuff. Um, you know, I, I had an RE 20 on, uh, just yesterday and I did some testing with a, with a friend because I, this is actually my first podcast. And, you're like, uh, you're like old hat, man. You sound great. <laughs> but it seemed too crunchy, uh, though. I love an RE 20 on a lot of things, especially kick drum. Um, so I put this on and then also, uh, Right now, I'm going through an Apollo and just using the um, the UA Unison preamp, and um, which sounds good. But you know, I did an AB with my um, Tube Tech preamp because uh, I wanted to just see the difference with hardware. And on the Skype call, um, it, the UA was preferred. But when I tracked it, yeah, when I tracked it in Pro Tools, though, uh, th the hardware was just winning for sure. Oh, and, fascinating. Uh, so anyways, I'm talking to you through the unison, um, cause it's easier and it works, which, which is a big topic for, um, actually why I got the Apollo rack. Um, it yeah, tell really us helped. about that if you want. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So I had a friend ask me to, um, to do a production licensing record for his, um, label, which is called primary. It's under the EMI umbrella and just to do an indie rock thing. And I was like, yeah, I'd love to do that. And so what I did is I made it an experiment. I moved away from, you know, most of my hardware and external preamps. And I just wanted to do everything in the box. So I, I got an Apollo, uh, X8P and, um, I did find that, again, drums in a small, dry, dead room were not working for me for this style, for this thing. So you mentioned Lior before. I did my drums with Lior in his living room. Oh, man. Oh, my Watch God. Watch out. It, yeah, he's got, he's got a, a 70s Gretsch kit, and he's got his whole thing dialed, and it's, it's modular. Like, he can go anywhere with his thing, and it's just instant good stuff. So anyways, I did my drums with him. And then I did the rest in in the box, and, and that's you um, playing drums on it too. Correct. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, dude. Uh, thanks. And man. then rock stars, um, just so you know which ones we're talking about. There's uh, there's two in the playlist right now. One's called Upbeat Rock, and the other one is Vintage right. Surf and Glam. <laughs> yeah, that one I did in the old studio, and and because it was like the old school thing, I I totally got away with doing drums in there. And, uh, you know, I had like a 26 Pioneer Ludwig and uh, just a bunch of old fun stuff. Um, and I, I think I was able to get away with that. <laughs> but um, yeah, but so the new stuff, it just, it deserved a modern thing uh, for the drums. Okay, cool. So the um, the Apollo X8P, you were talking about these ISO, I think, or whatever you call them, the, the, the preamps um, that... Well, they mimic other preamplifiers, but it's a plug-in, right? So you can do like a Neve 1073 or something like that? Correct. That's Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, and yeah, a 1073 actually is so versatile to me. I, I love it on everything, uh, especially bass. And so, yeah, they, it's like, you know, it's like a modeler. They have amps, they have preamps. And um, Talk to us about some of your favorites. I mean, you like the 1073 mm. for bass. Um, what are some of your favorite ways to record bass in your studio right now? Ooh, yeah, I've always found, and and the producers I've worked with, uh, you know, almost everybody likes multiple sources for bass, and I'm a firm believer in that. Um, okay, you you just want to cover a lot of frequencies because um, it's easy. It's so easy to get lost with bass. Let's see. I've got a an Evil Twin DI, um, which I learned about from uh, Lior Goldenberg. Uh, there's a Line Six X3 um, rack mount thing, but it has this one Vox tone for uh, for bass that I, I don't know. It just it just works for me. Um, so I had that going. So um, so when you say record multiple, maybe you should break that down a little bit for us. Yeah. So, you plug your bass into something first, right? Straight into the right, DI. Okay. Yeah, I go into the DI. 
Um, but I have a, a, a radial JD7 um, switcher. I also use the, um, the SVT from the Apollo, um, which really helped. It was really great. And that line six patch. And um, uh, maybe maybe a Sans Amp pedal as well. Yeah, Sans Amp is great. Yeah, that that always gives you some some lows and some grit that you just you didn't know you could get. <laughs> the Jay Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia and feature the patented Golden Drop capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings that classic vintage tone. Our friends at Jay Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, Recording Studio Rockstars listeners. Use the limited time coupon Rockstars to get 50% off the V67, V47, or the new V12 microphone at jayzmic.com. Atom Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class studio for professional mixing and mastering, their unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design is famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music, allowing you to focus on the mix. Visit the Atom Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitor and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. So, so um, give us a, a sense of like, what are you, what kind of judge decisions are you making as you do these? Mm -hmm. Like when you've got, you've got a DI that's going, you've got a line six thing that's going, um, right. you've got maybe a, a, a sans amp or a, and an SVT. Are they all, are you hearing them all at the same time? Do you sort of do each mm -hmm. one on its own? Like what's the way we should think about something like this? Well, I, I mean, everybody has their own, uh, way. I, I like to record them all and hopefully at the end, not get too tweaky as far as like, you know, uh, losing perspective by, by going crazy with which one's working in here and here and there. But you do have to spend some time as far as, phase and frequency. And, um, you know, I, I know some producers will commit to, to a blend of all their amps and all their pedals and all their gear. Um, you know, so they actually, they don't end up with five tracks of bass at the end. They end up with one or two, okay. you know, and, and, um, and that's, well, that's high level stuff. That's like you, you, you know, that's like recording in the old days, which was so great, which was that they'd mix as they're recording, you know, because you've only got one shot at it. So you have to get everything perfect, you know, like the Motown stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I ended up like with three or four tracks, but it's funny, like I, I have the mix done and, and then I'll go in it and I'll just experiment with taking one of the sounds out and, and boom, just I'm missing so much. Obviously, there'll be volume discrepancy, but frequency-wise, you know, wow, I really needed that, you know, that mm -hmm. extra sound, um, especially in rock, you know, when you've got distorted guitars and cymbals, like hard-hit cymbals, you know, it just, ba bass is, is really a tough thing, and um, you always have to make sure that, you know, you're adding as much high-end and mids um, as you're going to need. And because right. when you, this is the thing that bass players do all the time, uh, in the studio, I think is, you know, a, if you've got your headphones on, you're hearing all the highs and, and it's very bright because it's a tiny speaker right against your head. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and then you get to the end of the mix and like, you know, you got 40 tracks, 50 tracks, whatever your situation is eating up all your frequencies. And then it's like, ah, oh, I, and there's no definition, you know, yeah, but yeah. so, so it's important to, to really like almost overdo your mids and highs mm -hmm. when you're tracking initially. Um, that's been a, an issue for me for my whole bass tracking, uh, career. Right. You know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes sense, I get it like, right. Hey guys, can we have more bass in the mix, please? <laughs> Yeah. And it's also important to like really know what you're doing stylistically. Um, yeah. You know, one of the first records I did uh, with Vinnie Moore, it was like a guitar record, you know, and I was coming out of Berkeley at that point and I was super into Jocko Pastorius, you know, and, oh, yeah. 
what ended up on the record was was very kind of thin, mid-range, defined. You could hear everything I was doing, but this was a rock record and I missed getting the low end on the recording, you know? And uh, it was a big learning experience. So I was like, wow, you know, uh, listening back after a while, I was like, oh my God, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, bass is, it, it really is a funny thing. Um, and I appreciate you digging into this because it's fun for us to learn from you because you you both have the, you know, some of the experience of uh, do it, try, DIY, trying to figure out how to record it yourself, but also being the yeah. player and knowing what it feels like, you know, when it feels right, when you feel good about it at the end of it and all like. So you're recording with, you've got these four sounds and you're hearing them all at the same mm -hmm. time while you're recording it, right? Yeah. It's, it's important to hear them while you play, isn't it? It, it is. It is. And uh, let me just uh, tangent for a second, because what you said was uh, brings up an important thing of, of why I actually went in the box and got the Apollo. Um, I was able to get way more uh, creative and just get to tracking because I wasn't dealing with uh, amps and settings and wiring and this and that. Like I would just literally like when I had a couple hours, just come in, boom, plug in. Like my, my tone is already set, you know, right. things are right there and I'm boom, I'm recording. And, uh, you know, I just got right to it. Whereas like it's, it's when you're engineering and playing and you don't have a fun collaborative situation, it's easy to just be like, ah, oh, I can't deal with this right now. Or I've only got a certain amount of time how am I going to get anything done, you know, and yeah. focus? Or you spend all your time getting the sound and no time left for getting the music. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. So that was a really cool thing. And I'm, I'm still on the Apollo right now. Yeah. I'm, I'm digging it because I just get right to it. And yeah, maybe there's a little bit of like analog and vintage, you know, amp stuff that I'm not, not capturing. But at this point, like, I just want to make as much music as possible. And, um, and it's nice to, to keep up with this stuff because everybody's doing the Apollo. So, you know, why not know the newest stuff, you know, and be ready for any situation? Yeah, that's cool. Um, do you, do you mess around with, do you shift the timing of the, the tracks against each other sometimes or nah. do you just let them be where they are? I, I do sometimes, uh, that kind of actually like, it may throw us into another, um, uh, category here, but when I was working with Lior Goldenberg and Michael Beinhorn, um, there was a, there was a, a big topic of, uh, let's just say to start with groove. And, um, so Michael is, uh, I, I listened to one of his podcasts with you and, uh, I think he mentioned it in there, but he he's great, very, he? very, yeah, oh, dude, he's just, he's a guru. It's amazing. Um, he, uh, He's very aware of, uh, you know, relationship between bass and drums. And, um, and he pushed me to really play ahead, way on top, which is, which is funny because, like, in general, people are usually asking bass players to play behind. Right. And the thing that we were working on, um, boy, it was, it was intense to, to try and play everything way, way, way on top. And then you do it and you're like, oh, that's going to be crazy. And then you listen back and you're like, no, nah, you're not even really on top. You're right on it. <laughs> right. And I will say there was maybe an instance or two where we'd actually then take that whole performance and just move it forward even a little more just to get what we were looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's really fascinating to me. Because feel is so important, and when you start m adjusting bass against the drums in the editing stage, you learn some really interesting things. Like, um, there are times where I, I, I'm more often working on a bass track that maybe needs to sit back more, you know, that doesn't yeah. need to lay back more than sure, move forward. Sure. But one of the things you discover is that where you see the, the big part of the bass signal go up, if you moved that right to be in mm -hmm. line with the drums, the bass would sound way on top, you know? And I think, yeah. I think it's because 
we hear when the finger is on the bass string. And even mm. though it's not making a big sound, we register that as, as part of the feel. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, and I think also uh, frequency wise, if, if, and this is a problem with a lot of modern records, like if you've got everything on the grid and then everybody's trying to play to everything right on the grid, you've got all these instruments lined up so they're just eating each other's frequencies yeah. and that's the that's the magic of like old school like a zeppelin record you know where it's like maybe jpj is like way on top and the snare is way on the back but they're still grooving together I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the new subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Next. Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. The STX-100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX-100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX-100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, a and and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 into a single 500 module. Now you can get the same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's BBDI and complimenters. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801 Seven nine seven zero six four two. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Dorian Hartsong, joining us from his new budding studio in LA. Um, we're digging into more cool talk about bass playing, um, you know, finding the groove, making things sound great in the studio. Dorian, are you ready to jam a bit? <laughs> yes. All right, cool. Man. The answer. All right, cool. Um, you know, you started to talk about Led Zeppelin. Mm. What a what an interesting topic Led Zeppelin is, right? <laughs> you <laughs> you uh, play with Jason Bonham. Tell us about yeah. that. How did that come about? That's a, what a cool gig, man. It, it it is a cool. I mean, it's beyond cool. Um, so so Jason, I think it was 2010s, uh, decided to to do some shows, and. Um, he he did i think 20 or 30 first run um and the bass player uh, michael devin was a great guy great bass player he at the end of the run i think jason decided he wanted to do some more and then uh michael also had a chance to play with um white snake and he really wanted to do that and um so he called me in and and I I auditioned and um, I I'm a big Zep head so yeah. I was able to and the vocalist wasn't there so you know I I know the song so well I was able to like hit everything you know with without the cues of vocals or any I think that you know kind of impressed them and that's cool you know and and it just clicked and um you know, when they did those first 30 shows, I knew about it and I was kind of clocking it and tracking it on, on YouTube. And, you know, I, like I spent a lot of time feeling like, oh my God, like that's my gig. I got, I, what I, what do I got to do to get that gig? You know? And then <laughs> my friend calls me up and then, 
you know, just like hands it to me. It was, it was kind of an, a big, easy door to walk into, but then, you know, it was, it was a lot of work to, to, uh, to get all the live, um, material yeah. under my, under my belt for the first tour, which was like quick. So I just, I just went to work, you know, and, um, how many songs did you have to learn? Oh, catalog. you know, the whole catalog. And then, and then like, you know, there's, there's major live, uh, recordings, um, like the 70, the garden in 73. Oh, and, so you have to learn those parts. Oh from yeah. Live yeah. And, wow. Yeah. Because, you know, he, he's, he's a real deal. He, he, he'll just like, he'll be like, you know what, tonight guys, let's, let's pull something out of this bootleg or this live show. And it's like, and now that we, we've got this guitar player, his name's Mr. Jimmy. And he has devoted like 30 years of his life to, to be Jimmy Page. <laughs> and wow. it's amazing because he may know the bootlegs better than Jason, which is amazing. But like, you know, Jason will say like, let's, let's play, uh, you know, Song Remains the Same from um, 73 or another year of bootleg. And then... And then uh, Mr. Jimmy will say, okay, but what night? <laughs> you know, and we're all like, That's oh my amazing. God. <laughs> you know, but it makes it so easy and great. Like we don't even have to rehearse. We just, cut, you know, first show, fly in, just play it, you know? And it uh, it's exciting and it's fresh. It's not over rehearsed. Um, and it's great. So, you know, what a great excuse to have to learn the full catalog and the live stuff, you know, to go out and play it. Wow. So, it's great. so, I mean, you know, I did, I mean, I, I don't really know, I'm not much of a historian on all that, but did Jason, I don't know how close in age he was when his dad passed, um, or if he was, you know, had been playing with his dad or any of that, or is this like something where he, it came to him and his ability, you know, just became this sort of, you kind of you got the genes for it later on mm -hmm. when he when he started playing. Is there anything uh, to share about that process for him becoming such an amazing drummer? I'll just say that that he is an amazing drummer, and and if you go back and look at stuff that he did early on, you know, if you listen close, he had it like way back then, and his groove is is amazing, and um, his ear is amazing. He hears everything, uh, you know, don't, don't think that you've gotten away with something on stage <laughs> during a <your> show <laughs> because, <laughs> and he's, he's not, he's not uncool about it, but like, you know, if, like it's loose and, and like we talk about everything and he's, you know, he'll just, he'll hear one little thing you did. Like he's got big ears and a great groove. And, uh, I'll just say about him, like, what a what a great guy! Um, I, I really have a, a good relationship with him, and um, he's so fucking funny. Um, yeah. Sorry, um, that's great. You but, you're allowed to swear on this. Podcast. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, it's a know, studio podcast. If we couldn't swear, what, where would uh, we be? You know what I mean? But yeah, he he's uh, he's just fantastic. And then uh, and you know he really will sometimes you know, just embody his dad's fire sometimes and just do some fill where you're just like, oh, shit. That's wild, man. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right, so um, Rockstars, of course, I put together also uh, some videos that I found on YouTube of you guys doing some live shows, and maybe you can send over some more if you've got any favorites, okay. and we'll add them. But, um, you know, watching the video, one of the first things I noticed was there you are standing in front of a big, acoustic stack. <laughs> so talk yeah. about that. Talk about choosing the right bass um, rig for this gig. Right. Yeah. I did want to get it really close. Like we don't dress up, you know, it's not, it's not really a tribute thing, but, um, but I did want to get the gear. Like, uh, uh, you know, I use the 62 jazz bass and, and the acoustics, the acoustics are uh, a reissue. Those came out and like the, hmm, I'm actually not sure. I think I think it was late '90s, early 2000s, okay. and there was just there was like a run of them. They they don't do it anymore. Um, believe it or not, I have not put my hands on a real vintage stack and gone uh, like head to head, side by side. Uh -huh. Which is stupid. I I know I should do this, <laughs> <laughs> but it's something to look forward to, I guess. Well, it's um, nothing like accountability on the podcast. Now you'll have to, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. Um, but those things also blow up. So I'm not going to take one out on the road, I don't think. <laughs> but um, but let's break it down a little bit. So one of the things yeah. I remember being struck by the amp choice for that was like acoustic amps, they're solid state, right? They are. The power amp is down in the uh, speaker cabinet on the bottom. And uh, and then the the preamp up top is is like two pounds. It's super light because there's nothing in it. And um, I, that reminds me, that's funny. Like we went, it's not actually funny. It pissed me off. But we <laughs> we were on the road and we went to a show and the stage hands, you know, often uh, will load equipment, you know, for the techs. And um, anyways, the, one of them went upside down. And when it got there, you know, because it was like, you know, a thousand miles in a truck bouncing up and down, the power amp was upside down in the speaker cabinet, you know, oh, and it came apart. Oh, yeah, man. you know, but luckily, like it was, we were able to put it back together and get it going again. It's fine. But, oh man, that's, that's kind of the weird downfall of that, uh, power amp on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the big, um, you know, challenges about touring in general is, uh, yeah. You know, you're you're trusting people with forklifts to you know not drive it through your equipment stuff like that. We had that happen here where we were going getting ready to go down and do our Bonnaroo hay bale studio, and we had a console mm -hmm. coming, and it was supposed to arrive. You know, the day of we're getting ready, and we're waiting for the console to arrive, and then I get a phone call, and they're like, oh, I'm "Really sorry to, <laughs> to let you know, but they drove a forklift through it at the mm -hmm. on the tarmac, and it's like, oh my god!" So yeah. Those are just those things that you have to you have to like keep the cool head and practice for like the throw and go. It's it's just it's gonna happen. You're gonna have to shift gears and and do it right for show. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, you got to be ready. You can't. The show must go on, right? So yeah, yeah. Playing wise, I play the important parts and I know them all. But you can't go up there and play note for note. You know those songs because it's not going to make sense uh, with what Jason does. So if I'm playing on top of him, he's not, he's not going to play exactly what the drum parts are. He's going to do in his interpretation, which is like, you know, probably 80% or whatever, mm -hmm. but like he's going to do stuff that, you know, his, his, it's his own thing. So I got to be ready for that and get right up on it. So we're, we're improvising just as they would, you know, they're, they're like the grandfathers of jam rock and like right. every night was completely different and every tour was different. So we have to also have that element of not just, you know, playing the, the recorded performances night after night. Yeah. Now, you know, people come to see certain things and you've got to, you got to do that. You got to deliver that too. But, you know, we, we also improvise quite a bit. Um, yeah, well, it's a good thing we're talking about this in the jam session then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Adam Audio designs monitors with a mission to bring accuracy, transparency, and high definition to your studio, guiding you each step of the way on your journey from starting out in a home studio to installing your ultimate mixing setup in your pro studio. Check out their complete line of speakers and headphones from the T-Series to the AX Series to their top-of-the-line S-Series, which all use the unique ART Accelerated Ribbon Tweeter design, famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music. Want to feel awesome to make brilliantly accurate creative decisions in your mixes because you can finally hear your music clearly? Your ears are the greatest instrument you have, and if you can hear the music, then you can mix the music. Visit the Adam Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. Look, every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid-range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented Golden Drop capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio. 
studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, rock stars. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, and the new V12 at jayzmic.com. Let's see what else. What else would be good to say? So, what, um, are there some moments in those gigs where you sort of like have a real a bass feature? Mm-hmm. Is there, are there some bass feature moments for you? Um, they're all you bass know, features. <laughs> I, that's, that's what I was going to say. I, I really like he's John Paul Jones is so underrated, and and like each piece, if you really get down and listen, like is its own fucking opus it's so good you know so and and a lot especially the early stuff like zeppelin 2 like all those songs are very uh strong uh melodically on uh, the bass is leading a lot you know ramble on stuff like that where you know the, those lines are are uh you know not not simple and not and uh and very uh glorious so you know i there's there's only a spot or two, you know, maybe the beginning of Days and Confused where you're really tuning in to like like a solo moment for the bass. Yeah. But um, but yeah, I, it's I'm not looking for that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, talk about some takeaways for you. Um, you know, having learned all the Zeppelin stuff, all John Paul Jones's bass parts. Um, you know, I know some of it is like really laying down the low end. Some of it is really mm-hmm. being free up top on the neck. Um, what kind of takeaways or stuff have you transitioned over into your own writing or in the studio where you're creating, where you feel um, you feel like you you kind of know where to go in a song because you've studied other great players? Well, I was just going to say that you know uh, John Paul Jones using the pick as much as he does fingers, which people don't really realize. Um, it, it was very important to me because I had to I. I, my pick playing wasn't as good as my fingers. So I really had to do a lot of work to get that up to speed. And now I think I use it more. Um, the attack of a pick is so fantastic um, mm-hmm. and usable in so many situations. Um, it's it's really key. And um, I just say, you know, for bass players, like have have that together, have both together for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I always find it's fascinating when you start to discover things like that, like, how different a bass can sound played with a pick or played with fingers in the studio. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, even just like, you know, being in the control room and turning it way up loud and being able to play softly. It's like a way different right. sound than, you know, somebody digging in really hard out of a pair of headphones. Absolutely. That's another thing I've had to try try and learn is is turning your sound way up past where you thought it should go and playing a little lighter. So mm-hmm. you're not always digging in so hard. You know, uh, that, that's a, another technique that's really useful in the studio. Um, yeah. Cause when you're playing live, you know, you, everything's super blasting loud. If that's where you come from, you just dig in because you're trying to yeah. hear your dang bass, you know? Yeah. And then <laughs> that the becomes the, the habit. Guitars going. Yeah. That, exactly. When you think about stuff that you learned or stuff you see other people learn playing bass in the control room on a recording, are there some are there some simple go to things um, that can be problematic in recording bass that that are sort of like, you know, three a few things that every everybody needs to learn early on. Um, you know, one of the things I think about is um, like uh, strings that are still ringing when you're going from you know crossing strings on the amp. You don't notice it jamming out in the in the rehearsal space but you really notice it in a recording, you know? Yeah, your muting technique. If you're playing with fingers, you know, there's definitely a way to uh, anchor your thumb first on the E string and then play the rest of the strings with your fingers. And then if you go up even higher, uh, you know, then you anchor your thumb onto the A string so that those low strings are not uh, ringing out exactly like you said, and you get a nice individual uh, note selection from, from what you're doing, I, you know, but I, I think that just come like bass players learn that as they, as they go. And, um, yeah, it's, it's something that, I mean, I remember discovering that in the studio while we we're recording, you know, not even realizing it. And partly it's because the bass gets highlighted, you know, it really gets yes. amplified in a recording and you didn't, you don't even realize that 
the tiniest bit of that E string or A string just resonating a little yeah. bit. Yeah. It starts cross talking, you know, on the changes. Yeah, and it's stuff. true. I would also say the other way that like some of your, your artifacts and, and uh, imperfections somehow actually add to your sound or your groove as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's also important to not over analyze and, uh, you know, and also not when you're in the studio, try not to let those technical things, which are important, but override your, your fun and your listening and connection to the music and having fun. Cause you could really like take yourself out of it, trying to get everything too perfect, you know? Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, let's keep talking about, uh, headphones for a sec. You were talking about like, you know, what you hear when you're playing bass in the control room versus what you hear out on the floor. Um, what are some lessons you feel like you've really grown to know as far as making sure that you're, what you hear when you're playing a bass and a recording sounds great. Anything about, you know, what, what it takes to have a great headphone mix out in the studio. Do you ever use those, those things where they play bass through your seat or your stool? Um, <laughs> you shaker, know, to boost no. it? Yeah. The shaker. No, I, I've only seen drummers use that. I'm, I'm sure a bass player has used that, but no, I, no, I haven't done that. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. but yeah, uh, headphone, your headphone mix is so important. Um, it's, I struggle with it all the time because you get so fine tuned when you're recording and you're so focused in and, and you want to hear everything you need. You want a little extra kick and snare to really groove with the drums, but then, you know, you really want to hear yourself. So you're pushing yourself up and it's kind of like one of those mixes where, you know, the mixer just keeps pushing and runs out of headroom. Like, so, um, and headphones also don't allow as for feeling your low end as much. So it's right. hard, you know, you can start really like maxing out your headphones, trying to get that feel because you've been practicing in say the rehearsal room at a loud volume and it feels a different way, you know? Um, so, you know, you can experiment too with, with getting in the room with the drummer. If, you, if your headphones are good enough and you can, you can get everything else and take the drums out, that sometimes works. Um, I oh, did, interesting. I, so you're hearing the drums because you're in the room, but your headphones are mostly just giving you your instrument. Yeah, uh, I've done that. I, I I got in the room with the drummer on a Stevie Salas track. Um, are the gods the are the gods smiling on me? And um, it was Dave uh, Bruzzi's, if if that's how it's pronounced. Uh, and he he was with Pearl Jam for a while. Anyways, wow, that that dude's a great drummer. And um, I, my headphones were loud enough and had enough power to the point where I just felt like I, I want to go in the room and just feel feel that feel the groove and see if I can get it that way. Yeah. And we and boom, we just like one take. It just happened, and um, I was really happy with that bass performance. Um, and that was like, you know, being able to shift uh, on a dime to find what's going to make you play the best. So. Yeah. You know, and some um, some cats really dig, and I've done this too. Uh, you know, you just you sit next to the producer at the desk and play with the monitors. Um, but headphones, uh, because everybody's in their home studios now, you know, because of the current situation and uh, and technology where it's going, you know, headphones are the thing, and so it's it's really good to get good headphones and really start working with them and and always have yourself a good mix so you record the best you can. Now, have you noticed in your experience that headphones can sound quite different when you put on different pairs and try and hear your bass mix? Uh, absolutely. I had these Vic Firth uh, super uh, containing headphones that I used for uh, when I would practice drums that I took into a session and... Uh, and I kept telling the engineer, uh, you know, I'm not getting any low end. I can't feel the kick, no bass. Like, and then it got into like I started to get snippy, you know. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, this is a professional studio. I'm not sure what's going on here. And I was, a, I was being a dick. And <laughs> and and you know, and we finished. We we did the session, and it was fine and everything. And then 
at the end, I realized those Vic Firth headphones are shit. And there was, <laughs> there was no, I couldn't, you can't get any bass into them. And I felt so bad. I think I, I tried to like contact the engineer oh, and like funny. apologize. And, but yeah, so. Well, yeah, it's funny, headphones. but you know, a, a takeaway too is just how critical it is for you to have your headphones right in the studio. And it's so like, on the one hand, I'd rather have a musician that pushes back hard until we get it figured mm -hmm. out. That's right. That's often right. I might work with musicians who are a little shy about that or they just don't know enough, you know. I don't know if you've experienced this where you go out and listen to other people's headphone mixes and it's just so you're like, oh my God, this is completely screwed up. How did you shit? I totally. should have come dialed it in for you, you know? Yes. Take the yeah, if you're an engineer or producing, yeah, from that, from that angle, take the time to make uh your your artists and your musicians um super comfy with the sound with the sound like it's so important because that's where you're going to get the good performance yeah. they're not thinking about it they're not worrying about it and they're they're in the they're locked in yeah and yeah. and that guy on that session with you maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe he forgot to come out maybe he's scared of you <laughs> he forgot to come <laughs> out and and check your headphones because for me when i'm engineering if i go put on the headphones and listen out there I mean, as engineers, we're like, we're constantly thinking about how things sound. So we just right. immediately hear it and go like, oh, that's not right at all. That's not what I meant. You know, that's right. Yeah. Check their, check their phones or have some headphones in, you know, next to your gear that like you can monitor their, their exact line of audio. Yeah. And a lot of times what's funny is somebody will go like, yeah, there's just too much of everybody else, not enough of myself. Mm -hmm. And then you go out there and you realize all they needed to do was just turn their headphones up. Because like they just literally weren't hearing anything through the headphones, right, right. Or it's crazy loud, and they're like, "Can you turn it up?" And and you know that they're just gonna fry their ears. So you give them the old, there you yeah, go, yeah. Know. You didn't do anything, <laughs> and you didn't the little fake knob on the console. Yeah, the, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me see. Um, you did. You had the chance to go record. You know, great sounding drums with Lior. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot about recording drums, but as a drummer. You must have picked up on a lot of stuff. What What's some stuff that you feel like you really have learned, um, you know, great takeaways for making sure that you get the best drum sound, anything you learned from Lior, anything you like to practice? You know, mm -hmm. we even talked about this before about, um, you know, maybe using samples or not using samples. What are your thoughts about all those those things? How do you like to get the best drum sound you can? Symbols. Uh, symbols, uh, you know, can really overtake uh, a kit and, uh, and room mics. And, um, and I, I love, uh, Peisty 2002s, like, and they are the loudest symbol. Like <laughs> you can, you could play a large club and not need to be mic'd with those symbol. I, you know, no overheads needed. Anyways, um, there's, there's really an advantage to being able to, uh, hit your drums hard and play your cymbals gentler. If that's not a great word, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. but with a, with a little less and, and it's something to work on. Like it's, it's when you're rehearsing, practicing, like just, you don't need to like put it all into that crash, you know? And in fact, you're going to, you're going to choke, which can happen with drums. You can choke the sound, uh, by hitting too hard. And, uh, you know, Jason's really good, at, really good at hitting cymbals and, and you watch and you're like, it's just a very simple, easy motion, but it just brings out like the big tones out of a cymbal by hitting them lighter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I noticed that when I'm experimenting, you know, it's like if I do, a f sometimes you have to hit the snare and the toms hard, but if you hit the sit, the crash with that same yeah, the same amount of energy, especially if I hit it with the tip of the stick, it's just like mm -hmm. kaboom, you know. Whereas like hitting with the side of the stick on the crash can sound a little darker, like Poosh, yeah. You know? And you don't have to always do it, but be ready for the producer to ask for that because it comes up often, you know, depending on 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 the way they have their overheads uh, and or room mics uh, going, you know. Now, what about the hi hat? What about a balance of the hi hat and the snare? Um, is there anything we want to think about as far as, and, and I love that you're talking about playing the drums the best way, because of course that's how we're going to get a great sound is, you know, if, mm -hmm. if the right sound comes out of the kit first, you know? 
Sure, sure. Um, that's funny you said hi hat. Um, uh, my buddy uh, Brian Tishy, who's a phenomenal drummer, um, he hit me to this trick of putting a spoon over the over the mic. Um, you know, to block the snare, uh, getting into the hi-hat mic. Interesting. Um, yeah. And I, I've, I put, I've been using all kinds of things to block the sound just to kind of experiment, but, uh, but the spoon right off the bat worked. It was really cool. Um, just yeah. right on top of a 57 or something. Yeah. Right. The, you know, shielding it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's cause it's curved. <laughs> it's convex. The, you bend around the spoon. The spoon does not bend around the mic. <laughs> so, so said, uh, oh, what's the movie I'm thinking? Yeah. Come on. Help us out, rock stars. You guys know what movie? The Matrix. There you go. <laughs> um, yes. Do you use a blue spoon or a red spoon? That's what we mm, need to know. That that's one. right. You know, wives really don't appreciate the movie references, I've learned. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like how many years are you going to reference, you know, Cable Guy and... Uh, <laughs> Dumb and dumber here, dude. Awesome. Come on. Awesome. <laughs> so. um, okay, cool. So doing that to keep the hi-hat out of the snare mic a little bit. What what about snare mics? You know, have you, in your experience, is the 57 the gold standard yeah. of snare mics? Um, do Is it yeah. worth, you know, taping on a condenser mic and doing tricks mm. like that too? Have you seen that work well in the studio? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that work I did with Lior that we were talking about. Um yeah, he definitely had, I, you know, I don't know exactly which mic it was, but he did have um, two on the top, maybe tried one on the side. Um, cool. It's, you know, it's open for interpretation for sure, but I, I do love a 57. Uh, I've put all kinds of a Heil on there, a, uh, an SM7B. I've tried a, a whole bunch of stuff and the, the 57 just has this like weird frequency that's perfect for... Um, for yeah. a snare, yeah. for me, for me, yeah. yeah. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is the fastest, toughest, mini-sized, universal, portable USB-C SSD that lets you record from anywhere in the galaxy with confidence. With speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC you see Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Never worry about your storage and the safety of your music again. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. What else do we want to say about your home studio? Anything else that you're really excited about right now? You talked about putting up some treatments in there. Um, what about Checking your mixes, and you said using mm. headphones a lot, right? Yeah, definitely headphones. Um, uh, I'm just kind of – actually, you know what? Wait, keep this rolling because right now I, I can hear there's a gardener close to the house, and it's coming right through the garage door that I haven't – soundproof right, right 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 i don't know if you can hear it i barely but, uh, hear it but by the time i'm yeah. done mixing you won't even hear it right? yeah so i still have i've left the one of the garage doors um usable because you know when i when i build a little uh booth in here I, i'm gonna need that to be open to do you know building and supplies and stuff and then right, right. and then i'll seal it up but um you know i'm not gonna get so hung up this time on uh exact soundproofing you know though i have read the rod gervais um build your home studio book and it's so good and it's got so many ideas but also like he's very militant about like if you don't do it right the first time like there's there's no reason to do it at all because if you don't seal it correctly why even start why even spend the money why do it and it's true like like he's right but also I think it's important not to get intimidated by that kind of talk and and just do your thing anyways and soundproof it, you know, as best you can and work with it. And uh, and so that's what I'm doing. Like, I know my main room here is not going to be absolutely perfect. Um, but if I build a, a little booth, then I can get some serious 
uh, enclosure happening. And then I'm just going to just roll with it. And, and, uh, and when I mix, I'm going to be on headphones, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you're going to play drums in there and stuff, right? I don't know. Like I said, I, you know, I'll try and put a small kit in the booth and see how that works out. I've got, I've got a buddy I went to school with, um, Mark Donnell's he's a great guitar player. He's in this band, um, yacht rock review. <laughs> and it's, it's so great. Like I, if you know what yacht rock is, um, yeah. It's like that. Yeah. Okay. They do a show. Uh, so they're, they're a cover band, but they just put out their own record. And, uh, which is so, it's so good. I love this record. And, um, the producer, uh, Ben Allen, he did CeeLo and some other cool stuff. Um, oh, cool. he, he did such a good job on their record. And I was, I was reading or, or checking a podcast or something. He was talking about like doing drums in a vocal booth and so he could get the super tight uh solid sounds with no ambience and then he'd open the door uh to the booth and then mic outside of the booth to get his ambient stuff and uh and on this record like you know it's mixed with a little bit of programming and sounds and stuff but i i love it i'm I, and that kind of like inspired me a little bit to be like you know what i'm just gonna make a little booth and I'll tr I'm going to try that. I'll put the drums in there and see what happens. Yeah, that's great. I, that's a really cool trick. I built a dead room in my studio just for that reason. Oh, nice. Um, I I like to refer to it as a phone booth, though, because I feel like, you know, in this this day and age of Netflix TV series, um, creepy TV series, to tell people you built a dead room in your converted garage is a little disturbing, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I built a. I built an ISO room that's totally dead for doing drums for that reason. Um, it gets used for amps a lot. And then there was a time, um, I don't do it often, but I remember doing a session where I opened the doors and put mics out. And sure enough, just like you said, it's like this remarkably cool sound. And you can mute, you can have the room mics in there out in the live room and really hear it, or you can mute them and it goes to completely dead sounding even with the door that's open. Great. So I think you'll you'll have great luck with that. Living dead room. Living dead room. There you go. There you go. <laughs> awesome, dude. Um, well, so yeah, I think that the things you're saying are important to remember. So like, you know, building it right um, and then maybe knowing which things you can build right and which things to not worry about too much. When I was building my studio, I went and visited a guy named Roger uh, Mutno, who's been on the podcast, and he was showing me his studio and he pointed out that some people were saying like, oh, you know, you know, you've got these doors to the ice room. Oh, you have to seal the door perfectly. Yeah. And he was like, no, you don't. Like there's, there's a gap underneath. It doesn't matter. You know, you get in there and it's, it's isolated enough. And I feel like um, that's certainly something that we can get stuck on. But if we remember, if you, if you had to have perfectly sealed isolation between things, then gobos wouldn't work. Right. But gobos do work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, just having enough isolation can make a big difference. Have you ever had a chance to record in a big studio, um, kind of like Olympia or Olympic sound in, in, um, in London where you can just have the, the whole band in the big room and there's just gobos between the bass amp and the drums and things like that. Have you ever had a chance to record like that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. A couple times. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not sure where where we did it, but it's been so long. Um, you know, on some of the Power Man records, uh, we definitely had that going, and then yeah. uh, we did a lot of overdubs. So, like, a lot of it would be you, you might know, have started uh, like that, but then overdubs. Yeah, 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 exactly. I was just thinking about um, Sunset Sound. Um, we were working oh, with yeah. um, uh, Sylvia Massey and um, Joe Barisi, and Joe Barisi, um, he was like let's fire up the PA for the drums. And we were like, what? And uh, <laughs> so, you know, so he had a big PA in there. So you get all that like low end and cool stuff bouncing back into the drum mics. And uh, uh, that was my first time uh, seeing that. I was like, wow. That's <laughs> and, cool. And uh, yeah, and it's, and it, it never like overtook anything in the mix. It just added just like that little bit of like nice, like low end 
you know, kick. And, um, was there yeah. a PA already in the studio or did you guys have to uh, bring something in and set it up? I think he brought that in, uh, maybe with the barrels of candy that he also <laughs> would eat during the sessions. Wow. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's a big candy freak. Um, That's but that, that would, those sessions were so fun. Like it was all play and like, uh, you know, he'd have all his new flavors and have everybody try them. And then he, and then he'd be like, okay, so I mic'd up, you know, your, your Wagner's and your Marshall's, um, just try it out. And then it was just like, whoa, like best guitar sound we've ever heard, you know, like super mellow dude, just getting the great sounds. And then, yeah, Sylvia was like a cheerleader, like, and that that's such an important thing, like having like the up good vibe uh, in the studio to, to to get everybody to play well. Yeah, totally. But I, sorry, I digress. No, no, um, that's great. We're so I'm so glad you just <laughs> shared that story. What studio at uh, Sunset were you guys at? Was it? Uh, do you remember which one it was? Uh, I think it was an A, B, and C, right? Yeah, I think it was A. Um, I, I, what I remember is, is going to look for where, uh, Eddie Van Halen had his that was second, Eddie. oh man, yeah, uh, that's such great. a Van Halen freak. So. That's great, man. Very <laughs> cool. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's, let's jump to some of our closing questions then. Sure. Um, what, uh, you know, you talked about what was holding you back at, at the beginning, um, move to the next one. How about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Oh man. Uh, well, I'll go way back and, uh, you know, I remember, uh, somebody recommended using playlists and a comp track. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. And then I, I saw the uh, logic and I in it and I saw that it, it was great. And then I like, nah, just, you know. And then I went back to like having multiple tracks like for vocals or whatever and then like taking pieces from this one to that one. And, and then finally, like it really hit me one day. I was like, oh my God. God, this is the way to do it. You know, you, you've got your, you know, you can just like reference any point and then boom, 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 just listen to all your takes and just like make a quick comp track really. That was, that was big for me. I remember that as, yeah. you know, I was getting going. Um, Rockstars, in case you uh, haven't used that yet, in yeah. Pro Tools, you can select the name of the track, hold the shift key, and then just use the up and down arrows on your keyboard and it will go through the different playlists for you. So it makes it, super fast for um for auditioning you know one part yes. versus another and and I'll share this too to add to what you said Dorian which is when I switched over to the OWC SSD um mm -hmm. rather than my old spinning hard drive in there which I originally yeah. had for audio um the ability for the computer to switch from track to track and playlist and keep up with the speed at which I was switching them was like massive so that was really fun for me too right it really speeds things up. I'm I I'm know that there's like, you know, it's funny because you talk about um your studio stuff and, and you're sort of um uh humble about some of the aspects of the studio, but but I know there's stuff that you are just like crazy expert at and work at like lightning speed. And I'm sure it's like, you know, when you pick up a, the drums or the bass, um, you probably you know, we would probably watch you come up with an idea and be like, oh my God, that was so fast, you know? Oh, I, I don't know. It's it's all <laughs> relative. You know, yeah. everybody's at their own <laughs> speed or whatever. But I, you know, I just thought of one more thing that, yeah, that, please. that I got early on was was keeping your, um, your plugins um, at the same volume level as your source. So, yeah. you know, you, you put a plug in on and you start messing with it and you kind of crank it up, you know, and, and, or the gain immediately gives you more, you know, volume. And then by the end of that, like you're so far off of what your original source sound uh, level is going back, comparing, doing stuff. It just it starts to bite you in the ass. Yeah, no, that's a great tip because, um, you know, uh, biologically, we we think that things that are slightly louder sound better, even if it's the exact same thing, just turned up slightly. Happens all the time. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, how about sharing a favorite yeah. hardware tool, something physical that you like mm. to have uh, with you in the studio? Uh, you know, I love to have a, a looper ready, especially for bass, and it works for everything else too. Um, cool. Vocals are a little bit harder, but when you want to A, B, um, anything, uh, 
mics, amps, preamps, whatever it is, it's really nice. And to me, super important to um, loop something, loop a little riff uh, and have it going while you're doing your thing because there's so much, even the absolute best player, each pass is going to be different coming out of their fingers. So if you use a looper, you are getting an absolute distinction between whatever gear you're a being without the coloration of the performance uh whoa so it, you, so you're saying like take an actual loop pedal that's right and you pl- plug your bass into that and then go from that to whatever your bass chain is play a riff and then just let it loop now go over to the amp and start tweaking things until you're like yeah i like that that's right. That's badass, That's right. dude. So yeah. again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push back on you a little bit here. So um, no worries. I'm pushing back on your humbleness, your studio humbleness. You just dropped a, a first ever tip on recording studio rock stars. So that's going to be a, a forever <laughs> takeaway from us. That one is killer. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there should be even maybe a piece of gear uh, made to, to be the highest resolution, uh, you know, looper. And then also have multiple outs, like a like a switcher, you know, that I was yeah. talking about. So that like you can just instantly get your loop going and and that's incorporated in your um, you know, shooting out signal. Um, it's just so convenient for testing, et cetera, et cetera. But now how do we how do we put a giant a looper on the drum set so that we can keep hearing the drums get played over and over. Yeah. Again. <laughs> you know, drums and vocal are, are a little tougher for that for sure. But you know, I, there's, there's some smart cats out there that I'm sure could, could make some kind of gear that would, that would work for that. Maybe, maybe I, I have a looper here. It's called intern. <laughs> <laughs> Play the drums for me. All right. That's a good one. <laughs> Do you want to record killer drums in your home studio? Rockstars of Drums will show you how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with examples from a Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Do you want to know how to master your own music at home? Rockstars of Mastering will show you how with plugins in your DAW so that your music will sound awesome when you finish your mixes. And if you're looking for a step-by-step solution for a pro-sounding mix that won't take years to learn, the Ultimate Mixing Master Masterclass with Craig Alvin will show you a proven method for creating Grammy-winning quality mixes that you can apply in your home studio right now. Or if you just need to learn the fundamentals of creating a great sounding mix, then register for my free course, Mix Master Bundle, to get great mixes using simple, free plugins. And get started now making your best record ever at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash academy. Use the code ROCKSTAR at checkout to get 10% off any course for a limited time. So one of the things I sometimes like to ask is whether or not you sort of had an aha moment for yourself in the studio. You know, you're starting as a player, you're you're hitting the studio with uh, various people and you begin to learn more about the recording process. Was there sort of a light bulb aha moment for you in the studio with anybody? Yeah. Um, the most uh, profound recording experience I had was, um, recording with Michael Beinhorn. Um, he has a lot of, uh, amazing techniques to get the best performance out of an artist. And uh, he talks about that in his book. Um, I think it's on un- unlocking, unlocking crea- creativity. Creativ- yeah. 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 Great book. Um, and, um, uh, what, what happened was, you know, we started recording and I was, you know, I was playing kind of the parts that I had had for these tunes for a while and um and it was cool and it sounded good but it just wasn't uh you know it wasn't piquing his interest for sure he said okay we're gonna we're gonna start fresh and he had me play basically like a like a fantasy track that i heard in my mind uh without worrying about like my hands or mistakes and it was just kind of like a just go and and record whatever you hear and don't hold back and don't try and make it a, a super foundation. Just, just let it, let it happen. And the first couple of times I was really hard to do, you know, and I kind of blanked out and, and, uh, and then I was kind of getting pissed and uh, at myself, of course. And, 
Um, and then, but I think this is part of maybe his, his magic method or something, but you, you kind of break down for a little bit and then, and then all of a sudden you have a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to kind of let go of like those traditional and tired, lifeless base parts that, you know, they, they work, but it's like, yeah, we, we've heard this a million times now from, from 1960 to now, you know? And, right. and I was amazed. Like I, I just went for it and yeah, I made, I made mistakes and stuff, but I really actually did make a connection with like getting out in my hands, what I just instantly heard in my head. And it really surprised me. And we found all kinds of these harmonic and melodic counterpoint, you know, these magic gems. And, uh, Anyways, this concept, cool. it works in so many areas of life as, as well, because your, your subconscious often knows where you're going, you know, without thinking about it too much. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that was super profound. And so I've, I've always tried to use that, whether I'm playing or, uh, you know, getting somebody, you know, in their sweet spot for recording, um, and that was like an aha moment for me. That's awesome. So it's sort of saying, give yourself the freedom to just do anything goes until you get, you hit that moment of frustration almost because it doesn't seem to add up and, and then you break through. Yeah. And that's not necessarily the most important part, but the, you know, because maybe you'll hit it right away, which is you will find new ideas by not trying to lay down an absolutely perfect track or something right, that you've, right. you've, you've already, you know, rehearsed or set up, like your subconscious is going to find some amazing ideas. And what you do is you put it down and then you go back and then say, oh my God, look what, look what my subconscious did right there. Like, and then you fix it and make a, like a stellar track out of it, but you keep some of it if it's working, you know, and, and then you've got the best of, of everything right there. Oh, I love that. That actually reminds me of one of the ways that I've been working on writing songs, where if I'm taking lyrics and I've got music, I'll just let myself riff on the very first idea that comes out. Yep. It's a total disaster and a mess, but, yep. but then I go back and I say, okay, I'm going to trust that that first instinct was, you know, maybe a good idea and then just re re-record those with intention and um, and I find you're right. You can really come up with some brilliant stuff that way. I mean, I just called myself brilliant. <laughs> I think I think that's how the best writers probably do it. Uh, yeah. You know, I I have a tough time with lyrics myself, but uh, watching some really great writers do their thing, uh, that's that's what I've seen as well. It's like you you let it come, you just let it come out, and not try and like you know force it, and then and then you use your mind later to like you know fix it, form it, you know, get it ready. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I'd like to hear some of your songs. Thanks, man. I'll send them to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, do, have you put them up? Um, no, I mean, I'm still, these are, these are tend to be like sketches and stuff with friends. Um, we do a thing called poetry scores uh. where we'll actually take poems and then compose them to music yes. to, to sort of remove some of the obstacle of, of um, having to write the lyrics yourself. Great. And so in those situations, I'm just like looking at a poem. I'm like, I don't know how this fits on the music. But like you said, I just kind of riff it in there and then come back later and be like, you know, if if I come back, re-record the part and then come back and then double that, all of a sudden it sounds like that yeah, was the most intentional idea ever, you know? Great technique. I love it. It's fun though. Yeah. Cool. How about a favorite uh, software tool? Something that you're kind of excited about? Yeah, I really like sound toys. For bass, I I I use the Kramer Pi the Waves plugin a lot. Um, uh, for my master bus, the SSL comp, the G Master comp, that's mm -hmm. like that's my go-to for sure. Um, which and, which one uh, does the Pi go on? Is it like on the DI track or just any of the bass stuff? I, I, I use it on almost all of them. Awesome, dude. Well, so let's see. Yeah. Let me jump forward here. Here is uh here's a question for you. What about a tip or a resource for the business side of doing this stuff. You've been making a living at playing music um, and 
playing bass, recording, all that stuff. What what advice would you like to give the rock stars about uh, doing this for more than just a hobby? Right. You know, I, I think when you have an opportunity to get paid for a job uh, or a situation, it's important to to know your worth and ask for your worth. Um, and that's not something I've always done, but um, been working on and getting better at and finding that, you know, when you do that and then you get, you get paid what you think you're worth, uh, you feel very good. You feel confident. You don't feel resentful. Uh, you know, if, if you didn't ask for what you wanted, it also, I think it's, I won't say it's attractive, but I will say that it's an analogy would be like when you're, let's say you're on Craigslist looking at gear, which I never do. Uh, <laughs> uh, just kidding. Right, um, right. Yeah. But, you know, and you see, let's say you see two of the same things and one, one is priced really low and one's priced kind of high, you know, your immediate thought is like, okay, something's wrong with that piece. Uh, this one's got to be in better condition because, you know, the dude wants more for it. And obviously yeah. some people just don't know what they have and they list it wrong or whatever, you know, the, but my point is put it out there, what you're worth and people will respect you for that, you know, and don't, don't be scared that you're not going to get that gig because you've come in too high. But I, I think yeah, just know your it. worth and, and ask, ask for your worth. That's great. That's a great tip. Um, and like you said, just just uh, finding out what the boundaries are of what's going to work too, whether it's letting somebody else have that gig or, <laughs> or later deciding, you know what, I'm gonna, that was a little too high. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that can happen yeah. too. That's yeah. great though. Um, okay, cool. So let's uh, let's hit this question. Mm -hmm. This one's hypothetical, but we get to take the way back studio machine. You're going to go back mm -hmm. in time and find young Dorian uh, in Bean Town, hanging out at Tower Records, and say, "Listen, dude, I know you were uh, thinking about doing the studio thing, and and you want to do that. Um, here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could?" Well, maybe first uh, ditch the fanny pack and the ponytail. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I think say yes to everything. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if you don't have the time, of course, you know, you can't take everything. But I did a lot of like, uh, this is not really my cup of tea. Whereas I look back and I think, oh man, I should have just done absolutely everything because everything leads to something. If you go play a gig out with a band that you don't really know so well, or maybe it's not quite your style, it doesn't matter. If you can, go play it because somebody's going to come, come up to you after that show and say, hey, uh, I, I like the way you played. Um, you want to check out my band? You know, and, and that's just the way it's going to go. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah, if you if you're gigging, I mean, there's seven nights a week you could be get, playing a gig. Yeah, and right? it's the same in the studio. Like, if if you're in the studio, introduce yourself to everybody and say, "This is my thing, and this is what I do," and uh, people will respect that. You know. Yeah, I actually encourage my interns to do that here. I'm like, listen, you're here, you're on a session. Feel free to uh, exchange contact right. information. You know? There's also me, yeah, people. there's also a line. Where you don't you don't want right, your interns right. not, talking not, to musicians yeah. when they're about to do a take. <laughs> yeah, no, not right when we're in the middle of something during lunch break. <laughs> awesome, dude. Well, um, this has been a blast hanging out yeah. with you, man. It's so cool to meet you, and thank you for sharing so many cool stories of your experience um, playing with Jason, playing with Power Man Five Thousand. You know, setting up your home studio. I'm sorry we never really got a chance to check out. Um, you know, talk about your the movie Live Free or Die that you did. But Rockstars, we included that in the show notes mm -hmm. so you can go click through and see some of the trailers. It looks really cool. Yeah. It's, it looks like a funny movie, too. Yeah, well, well thank you for um, popping my proverbial <laughs> podcast, Sherry. And um, right you on. can take that out if you want. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's funny to just, like, see all those correlations, uh, those little uh, connections with you and I and uh, our past. And see, and there you go. Uh, like, because I said yes to doing this, I could have easily uh, felt 
too nervous or uh, said, you know, I don't, that's not really my thing that, you know, this is more engineers, producers, you know, but because I, I said yes to this, you know, the proverbial yes, um, mm -hmm. I, I've got, you know, so many connections with you. I didn't even realize that's, that's wild. And yeah, no doubt. You know, uh, so maybe same camp. <laughs> That was crazy. Same summer camp. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, say yes. All right, Rockstars, we'll give you a little insight into the summer camp. So they had this challenge um, obstacle course at this particular camp up in Maine. And it was something called the, the gulch. gulch. And it was like a, a high up cliff and then a gulch that goes way down. And it's just like crashing ocean water under you. And then another high up cliff. And there was a... You're on one end of the cliff mm -hmm. and you have to get the whole group from your end to the other side. And you have a one big rope called the elephant rope and then one very little rope called the chicken rope. <laughs> and you had to figure yeah. out, like, how are we going to do this thing? You fi we finally figured out that you, you, you take the elephant <laughs> rope and you tie it from a tree on one side to a tree on your side. And then you take the chicken rope and tie it to the elephant rope so that you can pull on it and untie the rope. It's, it was a, crazy, it's a group it was. challenge. There's there's going to be leaders and it's at brain power. And uh, it's, so it's like making a record, right? So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Except that you could die in the middle <laughs> well, of this one. Well, you could one. die. That's in one the of the jokes with music, right? <laughs> making a record yeah. too. How do you want the rock stars to find you? Where should they go check out your awesome work and uh, your, you know, your website? And what if they need to make a killer record? With oh, them? yeah. Uh, I didn't even think of that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, DorianHartsong.com. I've got email on there you can hit me with. Um, I've also got a dedicated uh, Instagram page for the for the Jason Bonham Led Zeppelin evening. That's uh, cool. Let me just put it this way, rock stars. If you want your record to rock, <laughs> send Dorian a message. And you, at least you'll know that your drums and bass are spot on. Uh, thanks. Appreciate that. Awesome, dude. Thanks so much for hanging with us, dude. It's really great to meet yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who have helped make this episode possible. OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of plugins and Rockstars at Jay-Z mic.com for 50% off select vintage series mics for a limited time. And remember to visit the Adam Audio YouTube channel for free interviews and masterclasses and use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of this podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.